Hey there, folks. John here, and this is the False Takes Podcast. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, this is our fourth episode. And for those of you guys that don't know what this is, uh, this is a, a podcast about art and film um, and the mistakes that we all make along the way to creating something new. Uh, today, we've got a guest with us today. Uh, his name is Josh Kirkland, and I'll go ahead and put him up here so he can wave hi. Hi. Um, and he is a script supervisor from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And um, or at least he lives in Atlanta, Georgia now, and so he's going to have a lot of a lot of interesting things to say um, about just being a script supervisor, what that's like, uh, and also being somebody who creates stuff on the side. Uh, in addition to being a, a script supervisor, he's also a writer and director, and um, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. So, uh, like I said, this is a show about the mistakes we all make along the way to learning or to creating something new. Um, this show was started because, uh, we saw that there's a lot of articles and stuff out there about, you know, the top 10 things you can do to be a good screenwriter and all this other stuff and, uh, the things you should do. Uh, but not a lot of people talking about the stuff that they, you shouldn't do because they've made that mistake and they've been there and they've learned from it. So, um, that's kind of why we're here and to get things started, uh, by the way, my co-host also today, like last week is, uh, the illustrious Doug Miller. Um, a DP and all-around fantastic guy, so he'll be uh, up there some as well. Um, but to get things started, I'm going to ask Josh a question. Uh, I did not give him the question, and those of you that watched the last couple weeks uh, already know what's coming. But Josh, what is your most overrated movie? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, gee. Um, most overrated Get out. Ooh. Do you have a reason? Um I mean, I've gotten a lot of hate from this from my friends. I think it's a extremely well crafted movie. Um the cinematography, the editing, uh the acting, all of it, it all meshes together really well. The direction is fine. I just don't think the uh the central conceit of the script is as strong as a lot of people might suggest uh mm. i don't mean to imply it's bad but it just didn't land for me the same way as it landed for a lot of other people okay cool um and now prior to this uh when we were just doing sound check and stuff you actually uh pulled up a script um oh, yeah. that you were reading so you you apparently read scripts um yeah in your spare time why is yeah. that um i mean you get a ton of perspective on how to tell a story and what goes into a movie, whether or not you see it uh, when you read a script. Um, so, you know, I always try to be reading at least uh, one or two. <laughs> uh, 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 sorry, one of my friends is watching. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, you, you can just learn a lot about how to tell um, Everything from character moments to story beats to how to convey a mood, even just from the words on the page. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed all kinds of different scripts. Um, you can learn a little bit or a lot about a little or whatever you want to say uh, from any, any kind of story, really. Uh, so you could be reading um, Eyes Wide Shut like I am. You could be reading When Harry Met Sally. You could be reading just about anything, and I feel like you can walk away wiser in some way just from having read uh, a script to a movie you like or to a movie you don't that's one of the things i think that um people kind of under underplay and it kind of goes with this podcast everybody who writes a script runs into problems and so reading a script you go you go okay well, how oh that's how they solved that problem yeah that's how they did that and you know reading a multitude of scripts is going to make you a better writer. I mean, the old axiom is you want to be a good writer, read. Yeah. And, and that goes for whether you want to be a screenwriter or whether you want to be an essayist or whether you want to be a novelist or a poet, you need to read. Sure. Uh, Chuck Jones once said something to the effect of, it doesn't do you any good to draw if you don't have anything to draw. Mm. Um, and 
so I like to put that into telling stories as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't know stories, um, it's going to be a lot harder to tell one. That that every frame of painting with Chuck Jones, yeah, is just brilliant, and it's, it's incredible. It's brilliant for anyone who wants to tell anyone who's an artist and anyone who wants to tell a story. Absolutely. So, well, what have you learned by reading? Um, Most recently, what's broken? Ah, and. Um, it really depends on how you break them, though. Yeah, um, a lot of scripts do not follow the formatting rules that you'll see uh, in um, Save the Cat or uh, in any number of screenwriting courses or YouTube videos. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn formatting uh, because you can't break the rules in the right way unless you know them. Um, I've also learned a lot about how to... Uh, describe little character moments even without dialogue without hopefully taking too much away from the director or the actor once they get on the set with the material um when harry met sally is a wonderful wonderful script and a really really great movie and uh so much of the stuff that is wonderful about that movie comes from the uh actors billy crystal um and meg ryan uh but also from just the way the script is written um the little nuances, a lot less of it is improv than you might think. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Well, um, before we go too much further, Josh, tell us um, who you are and what you're doing in the industry today. Um, a little bit about uh, not just not just what you do or like what your job is called, but like what it, it is you actually do on set. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Josh Kirkland. Um, I'm a script supervisor, um, most often. Um, and so what that means is on the, uh, set of the film, I'm usually with or near the director, uh, most of the time, um, at video village or in front of some kind of monitor. Um, and I have, uh, the script in front of me and I mark it up and make notes based on what we shoot. I also make, uh, detailed notes based on each clip, each shot, each take, all that stuff for the editor once, um, the movie goes into post they can refer to my notes to know like you know the director's favorite take or the circle take as it's called uh was the third take but the fourth take was actually better for uh dialogue or things like that um so i'm basically there to make sure on set that the uh writer of the script is going to be happy with the way their script was translated into film and uh that the editor of the movie is going to have enough pieces that fit together right to tell the story Cool. Yeah. I mean, um, as an editor, I can, I can tell you it's super, super evident when, uh, they didn't have a good scripting on the set, uh, because it, it creates a lot more work for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I totally get that. Uh, so before you went down to, uh, you're in Atlanta now, yeah. um, before you went down to Atlanta, uh, what were you doing and how did you make that transition down there? Um, so talk, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, well, um, I graduated from college in May of 2017. Uh, and I was basically just kind of existing for about three weeks after that. And I got a call to do my first feature after college. Uh, so I did that uh, for about a month. And how, then, how was that experience, your first it was, feature? It was intense. Um, being thrown into an actual professional uh set experience uh straight out of school basically you know i hadn't worked on really anything since i graduated so it was basically just uh the end of college a little bit of downtime and then okay you have to go do this professionally and try not to get fired um and uh that was that was cool uh intense um every movie uh is a learning experience i think uh but yeah i did that one um and then um like two days after that, I went to Michigan to work on another film uh, for someone we both know, uh, Spencer Cameron. Um, and that was also a really, really great experience. Um, and then maybe about three more weeks after that, I moved to Atlanta with Spencer and uh, our other roommate, Ryan. And we, uh, Spencer had a guaranteed job, but Ryan and I didn't but we were just gonna make it in the movie business. Uh, 
and we had you know everything we had heard uh suggested at that time in 2017 atlanta was like the place to go uh more and more stuff was filming there thanks to shows like the walking dead and you know at the time avengers uh infinity war and endgame were filming pretty much back to back starting that fall um and because the big stuff was there the smaller stuff was there too so we just all three of us moved into a house uh, uh right outside atlanta and we just started trying to work on whatever we could cool um so uh if you could tell me um when you made that transition was there anything that you would do differently um, um based on on what you did because you said you went down there and you didn't really have like a steady job or anything like yeah. that lined up um so how did that end up working out because i think a lot of people that want to go to la or want to go to atlanta or new york or whatever, whatever production hub they want to go to yeah. don't necessarily have it all figured out mm. um when they go so what's your advice would you would you say you probably should have waited till you were a little more solid or did, did it work out pretty okay and, and um, like what, what's your advice it's a tricky thing because it's going to be different for every person uh for sure um but yeah i might recommend most people before you move to your your film city which is probably going to be la atlanta new york or maybe chicago uh it's good to maybe at least have like a part-time job have like a lead on something like that because it's really hard to just immediately jump into a, a city's film community. Um, and it's going to be very competitive for just about any job from PA all the way up to, you know, DP, director, producer. Um, people don't really know you yet. They don't really know your work. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd recommend trying to find something to pay the bills before you make that huge commitment because it's, it's a huge uh, financial burden to move and get settled in a new place and do all the things like you might have to get a new driver's license if you're moving to a new state or register your car in a new place and like all the things that come along with moving to a new place. Um, it's definitely way smarter to have some source of income when you go somewhere. Um, I was really fortunate enough uh, to have connected with a few of the um, alumni from my school that were already in Atlanta. So they helped me get some days on TV shows pretty quickly uh, after I got there. And then uh, within a month of me being there, another graduate from uh, my school, uh, Jeremy Crouch, was able to help me get on to a feature film um, as a PA. Um, but that's only because I had some people that I was able to uh, really connect with and who could see that I was going to do whatever it took to try to scrape by. Um, and it's not like to pat myself on the back. It's definitely because of those people that I was able to keep doing what I was doing. Uh, without that, yeah, I would have had to start working anywhere I could. And I think people definitely should find something and then look for the movie jobs once you have that kind of security or stability, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you, uh, you talked about networking, talked about knowing people. How important is that? And how do you go about, cause I mean, you got to maintain your network too, right? Like yeah. you can't just like go on the people that you, you knew from the beginning. So how do you maintain that network and, and how do you kind of grow that when you first get into that new market? Um, well, uh, one thing that's worked a lot for me and for other people is Facebook pages. Uh, I don't 100% love uh, Facebook. Um, but social media is a huge way to meet new people in the movie business or in, in just any kind of like creative or entertainment uh, field. Um, you can use, you know, on Instagram, you can use hashtags and follow people who use those same hashtags. Uh, or on Facebook, you join groups. Um, there's, I'm probably in like 10 to 12 different Atlanta film related Facebook groups. And there can be as many as like, thousands of people in some of these groups and so they'll post you know hey i need a pa and if you get on that real quick and you are you know polite uh and respectful um there's a good chance you can get that job um and so it's it's just a real mix of uh genuinely trying to meet people not not using people like the worst thing in the world is when you meet someone you can tell they're looking right through you they don't care uh, it's just like what can i get from you um, and that's so common in the movie business. People will do that to you. People do that to me regularly when I'm working on stuff. Uh, so you got to try to be the difference. Try to let, try to look people in the eye. Let them know that you genuinely want to know who they are. 
uh, like be a decent person first and people are going to remember that. And then they remember how hard you worked. Um, but also definitely social media. Um, you can look on even Craigslist, which be careful. Uh, but like message boards, uh, Facebook groups, um, Instagram, things like that. And then just going to places where you can meet people. Um, like one of my friends, when I first got to Atlanta, had a short film that was premiering uh, on the lot at Pinewood Studios. And he invited me. Are you kidding? I had to be there. So uh, for go. those that don't know, what's Pinewood? Pinewood Studios, uh, which it might get a new name soon. Uh, but Pinewood Studios is a movie studio um, in Fayetteville, just outside Atlanta, um, Georgia. And the big movies film there. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming film there. Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame, uh, Black Panther, um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, a lot of the big stuff. I think the upcoming Disney Jungle Cruise movie might have film there uh zombie land 2 i think film there as well uh it a lot of the bigger film cities have these lots have these studio places where the bigger movies are shot and just because you move there to that city doesn't mean you're going to be on that lot a lot uh, but like uh if one of those studios is in a city it's a pretty safe bet other things will also film in or around that area cool um so specifically, uh, you're talking about getting jobs and stuff like that. So specifically, talk to me about um, being a script supervisor. What does that look like? What do you um, like? What do you do to, to get those jobs? And if somebody's interested in script supervising, what would they want to do? What do they want to work on now, so that whenever they get to the market, that they, um, you know, can can walk down that sort of thing? Yeah, um, getting the jobs for me. Um, the first one after school, uh, the, uh, person who called me remembered me from a short film I had done and they remembered I did an okay job there and they were like, Hey, you want to do it for a feature? And I said, yes. Um, and then for Spencer's film, I knew Spencer, uh, we'd worked on a bunch of stuff together. And then when I moved to Atlanta, it was those Facebook groups. Uh, one day I saw a guy post looking for these positions and script supervisor was one of them. So I commented, I was like, I just happened to be on Facebook at the right time. Uh, I sent the guy a message. He asked for my resume and some samples of my work, sent that stuff to him. And within a few weeks I was driving to Kentucky to work on a movie. I had never been to Kentucky, but I was going for that. Oh, Kentucky's a great place. I was born there or not born there. I grew up there. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, it, it's all about just being vigilant, looking for the opportunities, getting on those, uh, those social media pages. Um, you can use websites like Mandy or Staff Me Up. I have gotten work uh, through some of those, but those do have an upfront cost uh, and a monthly subscription cost to get on those kind of uh, pages, but that's where a lot of jobs are posted too. And it's really just about staying vigilant, looking for listings, looking for any opportunity, you might have to do some unpaid short films just to get to meet people and build up your resume a little more. Um, and as far as the script supervisor, uh, well, if you're interested in doing that job, um, you are in close proximity to the director all the time. You will probably get to talk to the talent sometimes with the directors. Okay. Uh, but um, it's a lot more meticulous note taking and keeping track of like little tiny details. It's not um, this glamorous thing where you, you have the script and you can like shut people down all the time. Be like, nope, that's not in the script. Uh, you can't do that. That's, that's a good way to get beaten up. Uh, but um, yeah, things you could be doing now, there, there's some great books you could read. Uh, I definitely recommend um, Beyond Continuity by, I hope I don't say your name wrong, uh, Mary Cybulski. Um, if I did say your name wrong, I apologize. Uh, and just to just to interrupt real quick, I will make uh, I'll put links to all the books or anything that Josh references in the description below uh, after the podcast is over. So um, if you want to know what any of those are, uh, you'll have to give me probably thirty minutes after we're done because I'll have to go back and review. But those will be down there for anybody watching. Awesome. Um, you can also, um, I suppose. Uh, watch a lot of movies to see if you notice differences in continuity um, between shots, uh, between scenes. Um, learning what continuity is in a film 
um, and what it isn't is a really important thing if you want to do the script supervisor job. Uh, I would also recommend uh, learning how best to try to take continuity notes, uh, whether that's going to be an app like Script E, uh, which is an app for computers and iPads, or making your own sheets in Excel or something else. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, and there's no set in stone way to do the job. So you've got to find a way that works for you that lets you take notes efficiently and quickly without losing track of what's going on with the script and what's going on in front of you on the set. Um, learn to focus on like 30 things at once, which is complicated, but simple at the same time. There you go. There's my mic. Sorry. I was writing things down. Um, so, uh, that's awesome. Uh, so you, uh, you've done a lot of script supervising. Is there one project in particular that, um, you want to talk about where you, uh, either it ended up being a really good experience or it ended up being a really rough experience and you don't have to name, name names or anything like that, but um, ended up being a really rough experience where you learned a lot. Like what, what is the, what's the one that sticks out in your mind the most? Oh, gee. Um, Well, uh, something I've learned a lot is when to pick your battles as a script supervisor. There will be things that are going to be wrong or things that you know probably won't match in just about every movie ever. Uh, and you can't always fix that. Sometimes the director overrides you or it just has to be that way to make the shot work. And um, is it worth fighting with someone, fighting with the director, fighting with the DP, fighting with props? Like you're all on the same team um, and you're only trying to make the movie better. So if there's something that's out of your control, don't let that ruin your experience or ruin the work you're doing. Uh, just make your note, move on. Uh, try not to cause conflict with the crew. Um, uh, there was another movie where uh, I ended up having to do a lot of extra overtime um, because of some things I was asked to do that weren't really part of my job description, but if I didn't do them, they weren't going to get done. Um, and I charged the production a lot of overtime because the movie was already really hard. And I was being asked to do a lot of things that were on top of like 12 to 14 hour days. Uh, so I was being up for like 18 hours before I could go to sleep and getting my turnaround a lot shorter. Um, and so I charged them for that overtime, but uh, I ended up kind of burning that bridge. Like I got the, the overtime from my work, but uh, I do not necessarily work with all that crew anymore. And that's not like hard feelings on my part. It's just sometimes you sticking up for yourself uh, is a little bit of a risk and a challenge. Uh, and that comes back to knowing when to pick your battles on that movie. I knew based on the hours I was being worked, uh, I needed to get some kind of compensation for that because I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. Uh, I was exhausted all the time. So it was, you know, if you're going to be exhausted, might as well have a little bit of extra money in your pocket too. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely does. Um, so cool. Well, um, moving away from scripty a little bit, we may come back to that. Um, you're not just a script supervisor. No. Uh, you do, uh, writing and directing your own stuff. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's some of the stuff that's actually, uh, gone pretty far in terms of film festivals and stuff <laughs> and actually getting, um, uh, getting seen, seen by some folks. So, um, first off, let's talk, uh, about how you balance that, uh, creating your own content, writing and directing, um, and then also making money, you know, doing script supervising, doing whatever other work, because writing and directing doesn't always pay. No. Um, and so how do you balance that? How do you find the time to do that uh, in addition to doing the stuff that you do to survive? Yeah. Um, well, when I'm working on a movie as a script supervisor, or if, sometimes I'm not even a script supervisor. So, you know, I could be doing whatever on a film. Uh, but like when you're working on a professional gig, there's not a lot of time to do other things. Uh, there's not... Like someone will think I see every movie that comes out sometimes uh, just because I work on movies. But when I'm working, I don't, I hardly do anything besides work on the movie. 
but the really, really cool thing about being a freelance film crew member is when you're not working on a movie, you are uh, unemployed. <laughs> so in between gigs is the perfect time to write a script or uh, think of ideas for a script or, you know, collaborate on a story with a friend. Um, like I've co-written and co-developed stuff with friends. Uh, and that's sometimes been even more fun than writing my own uh, movie. Um, but um, for me, it always uh, comes back to like a core idea or line or image. Uh, and I kind of think of the rest of the story from there. Um, so, uh, you know, my most recent short film, I thought about uh, horror movies and then dead end jobs. And I was like, well, is there a way those two things can go together? Maybe there is. And out of that came Reggie, um, or, uh, so, so, so oh. let's, let me interrupt you. You mentioned Reggie. What is Reggie? Reggie is a short film that uh, my extremely talented group of friends uh, helped me make um, a few months ago. Um, and a bunch of people, both of you know, were involved with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's a short film uh, about a nice, uh, mild-mannered guy named Reggie, uh, who's 28 years old. Um, he loves to paint. He loves daffodils. His favorite color is blue. And he also uh, kills people for money. He is a slasher like Jason Voorhees uh, or Leatherface, but only to pay his bills. He doesn't love it. He takes no joy in it, uh, but it's the only job he could get. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a little look at this guy's life. Um, and it's a super silly, goofy story that takes kind of a turn towards the uh, towards the end that you probably wouldn't have seen at the very beginning. Um, but uh you know, a lot of people work dead end jobs. A lot of people are afraid to open up to other people. And um, I thought horror could be a good, uh, a good v avenue to explore the uh, silliness of regular life. So I tried to make horror kind of mundane and goofy um, and take a look at what that would look like for a guy whose world is, you know, Friday the 13th or Halloween. Cool. Well, um, just because uh, we like to be prepared, we actually have uh, the trailer for Josh's uh, film uh, ready to go. So we're going to show that. It's about 60 seconds, and then we'll come back, and uh, Josh can talk more about that and his creative process um, and lots of other stuff. So here we go. Hello. My name's Reggie, and... I'm 28 years old, my favorite color is blue, and I kill people on the weekends. House, we made it. Come on, come on. So there we go. Um, so that was the trailer for Reggie. Um, so interesting, interesting concept you had there, uh, Josh. I've seen it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you oh. guys can find it. I, I went ahead and linked it down in the description as well. Um, so you guys can, can, can uh, see it down there. Um, and But tell us a little bit more about um, kind of the process of creating something like that while still holding down a job and paying rent and everything else because yeah um you know did it did it happen all in one day did it uh was it a thing that you had to do over over time like tell us about that process um reggie goes back about five years ago actually uh, i wrote the script right before i started film school uh like the summer before um and when i got into film school i realized i just could not make that movie there uh for a few different reasons um so i just kept it in a file on my computer um and uh yeah i got out of school and i started working on movies um 
and uh, a number of my friends that I went to school with or otherwise had read the script or knew about it. They just knew about, you know, Josh's uh, goofy horror comedy. Um, and uh, so I kept it on the back burner. And um, last year, my friend John and I got to direct a music video for a band in Atlanta called The Carolyn. Uh, if you guys are watching, hello, The Carolyn. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, so we did this video for them last year and um later in 2019 they invited us to a festival uh for for where they were playing and a few other local bands were playing so we went just to see them to keep up with them because they were our friends and we wanted to maybe meet some other bands and while we were there um we were just hanging out um i wasn't i didn't have any movies going on at the moment i had just gotten off a movie um at the end of uh the summer and so this was like the very beginning of the fall and um while we were there, we were just talking about maybe we could make something soon. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. And John was like, well, hey, let's make Reggie. Halloween is coming up. And I was like, are you serious? You want to do it? And he's like, yeah. So in September of 2019, we decided to make it. And we spent uh, about three and a half weeks prepping, uh, visiting Halloween stores, buying the decorations. You can pretty much tell when you watch the movie it was all but at a halloween store but like that's part of the the hokiness we wanted to instill like horror movies aren't real but like if they were they probably wouldn't be as as stylized as they look they'd be whatever people had around the house to build a torture chamber <laughs> um so yeah uh we started getting um props and set stuff together we were looking for locations for a few weeks um uh, John helped me produce it. Uh, he had a, a job several days a week. So when he would get off work, uh, he and I would meet up and we'd plan the shots. We'd plan um, who the crew was going to be. Um, I had a guy in mind to play Reggie for or five years, and we were lucky enough to have enough budget to fly him in. And that was our friend Spencer, uh, who everything good I've made just about is because Spencer has helped me out with it. Uh, so shout out to Spencer Cameron. Um, but, um, yeah, we, uh, we were able to raise the funds from, from myself. I had worked on a lot of movies. I had some money. Uh, John contributed some money as, uh, the executive producer and we got money from a few other sources. Thanks mom and dad. Uh, and, um, we were able to fly in two of the talent, um, and all the rest of the talent were our friends local here to Atlanta. Um, so Sarah, Tati, Andrea, Andrew, and Taylor, uh, thank you all for being in the movie. Um, and the med scientist, yeah, it was our friend Hunter, who we also flew in. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just uh, this awesome combination of people wanting to work on this project and help us out because uh, they liked the script or they, they liked the idea or they believed in me, which is still mind boggling. Um, and uh, it's just one of those uh, special times when I was in between features and most of my friends were too. So it wasn't like we had a lot of other commitments uh, at the time. Because like I said, when you're in between gigs as a crew member, uh, you're just looking for the next one. You're not really doing a lot else. So we were all still looking for gigs and we made it very clear, you know, if something comes up, don't do Reggie, take the paid job. Um, but our friends came along and we shot it over three days uh, and edited it and got the music done really quickly over like a week and a half period. And it came out on Halloween, just like we hoped it would. Does that cool. answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that definitely did. Um, so I've got a couple more questions on my list. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm sure has some stuff for him as, or on his as well, but, uh, do keep in mind, everyone, uh, if you're watching live, you can ask questions, um, and I will read them. Um, and communicate them to Josh. So uh, as we get through our last couple questions, make sure you uh, get yours in there. Um, if you want to know anything about Scripty or uh, even the Atlanta market or anything like that that Josh could uh, perhaps talk to. Um, but for now, uh, from a writer and director perspective, since we're still talking about the stuff you've created, what practices have you found to be the most useful in um, developing that, uh, you know, between gigs and, and, you know, when you're not working, um, and, and that sort of thing, what, what helps you in your creative process and what helps you continue to be motivated to, uh, create even in between gigs and even when you're not around movie stuff? Um, 
Yeah, watch movies. <clears throat> um, the best way to learn about movies is just to watch them. Um, uh, watch movies that are maybe not the normal kind of movies you would watch. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Miller can definitely vouch for the fact that I started watching a lot more foreign films when I was in film school, uh, which really had an impact on the movies uh, or on like the movie I was making then <clears throat> and the movies I grew to like more. Um, so the Criterion Collection, uh, Criterion Channel, stuff like that, that's a great way to expand your film knowledge. Uh, if you don't know names like Bergman, Kurosawa, uh, Tarkovsky, learn those names um, because uh, there's nothing wrong with watching new movies or movies that were just made in the U.S., but you'll get a much more broad perspective of storytelling and craft from watching other films uh, that were made in other places just to get, like I said, other perspectives on what it means to do everything from tell a story to where to put the camera. Um, read and... Uh, read a lot of things that maybe aren't movies, read books, um, read plays, uh, cause those are similar to movie scripts, but they're different too. Um, <clears throat> just experience as much life as you can. Cause you'll find inspiration for telling a story just about anywhere. Um, like, uh, one of the movies I made in, well, the, the movie I made in school, the one that's been in the most festivals, uh, came, in part because I was obsessed with the director Wes Anderson and his films, but also because uh, I had a situation, like a personal situation, uh, where I was just kind of down in the dumps and just spending a lot of time uh, listening to like sad music in our computer lab at the film school. And uh, that combination of that melancholy music and Wes Anderson kind of came around and gave me an idea and uh, that became my thesis film I made in school, uh, which you both uh, know about. Um, but yeah, I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere. And again, like Chuck Jones would say, he would say, go just watch life. You know, he would tell his animators to like, go to the park and see how people move, watch what they do. Um, go to like a mall and just people watch and try to think of like, what would that person's story be? You know, uh, how did they get here? Um, just talk to people, uh, hear, hear their experiences. Um, you'll find little things in your life, like little lines of dialogue uh, that just kind of happen naturally. And you're like, oh, I got to put that in a movie. I got to put that in a scene. And then you start thinking of a scene based on one silly line. Um, you'll wake up out of a dead sleep. One time I was at... <laughs> Disney World with some of my friends and I woke up in the middle of the night with like three lines of dialogue that I had to type down on my phone right away and ended up being in my thesis film uh, several years later. Um, so um, I mean even uh, in Reggie, uh, the the very end of the movie, uh, there's, there's a post credit scene uh, came from two of my roommates uh, saying, hey what about this? There's this one element in the script that uh, I feel like we never get a full answer on what happens there. And I was like, all right, time for a new scene that I wrote like a week before we shot the film. Um, <laughs> even though I'd had the script for five years. Um, so I don't know, just soak it all up, be a sponge for ideas. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so we do have some questions from chat. Um, and so first I want to, uh, we have one from the writer's quill. Um, it says, what are some of the best traits to look for in a crew uh, as far as their character goes? Like, what are the kinds of people that you want to hire, or not really yeah. want to hire, but want to work with? You want them to be people that you know are going to work hard, but also just be decent people. I would rather have a person that I know is going to do a good job and have a good attitude. And maybe they're not the absolute best person, but they're pretty good. I'd rather have that person than the person who is like, the absolute best I could ever find, but they're a jerk or uh, they're, they're mean to everybody. Um, and it's, it's a hard thing to uh, figure out even for yourself. Like, I mean, you guys know when I was in film school, I had a lot of growing up to do. Um, I thought working hard and being like 
knowledgeable, quote unquote, would be enough to get me where I wanted to go. But I had to figure out a lot more and experience a lot more life. Uh, and I'm still doing that. I'm, I have not arrived at all. But like in your crew, you want people you can rely on. Uh, not just, hey, can you put on that or put that light on a stand over there and you trust that it won't fall. But like, hey, can I trust you just as a person? Like, are you a decent guy or girl? Um, because that, those are the kind of people you want to work with again. And hopefully, they're the people who will call you for something else. Um, and maybe they'll just be your friends outside of that, right? Um, some of my favorite memories with people who ended up working on my films or who I worked on their films are, like, not even working on movies, just hanging out and having a good time with them, like, doing any number of just regular, normal, daily life things. Um, because in the end, crew members are just people. Um, and you want to surround yourself with people who hopefully make you better too uh, and that you can learn from. Cool. Um, well, I have two questions in the chat. I'm kind of going to combine one from Darren and one from Ethan. Okay. Um, so for people that uh, maybe don't have the opportunity to um, learn from... I don't know, a uh, film school or something like that. Cause you mentioned film school a lot, but the, the, to for the, the people that don't have the opportunity to learn from that, um, type of thing, uh, how to be a scripty. Cause even a lot of film schools don't even really cover that, no. that area of things. Um, how do you learn to do that job? What are, what are some resources that you would, that you would suggest? And yeah. two, the other half of that, once you do feel like you're, 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 you have a good enough handle on it. Um, how do you figure out a rate and what would you charge mm. um, based on that, that amount of work that you have to do? Yeah. Um, as far as resources, again, uh, Beyond Continuity by Mary Cybulski. Um, you've, in that book, you've got examples of uh, the script supervisor's notes from movies like Life of Pi, uh, which was a super visually or visual effects heavy movie. Uh, so you can see what it's like to <clears throat> map out dialogue scenes or scenes with VFX, which, I mean, if you're just starting out, you probably won't be doing scenes with VFX, but that's, important stuff you should learn if you want to do this as a career and like try to rise up in the uh, in the business um pat miller's book uh script supervising and film continuity is a little bit of an older one but like that's probably the standard for books on the profession um and again that book that book taught me a lot of the basics uh thank you natalie for <laughs> recommending that book to me uh four years ago um, can you just say it one more time what was the title script supervising and film continuity i believe is the title Got it's it. by pat miller um, I have it in my house somewhere. So if that's, if I got that wrong, I'll find it and I'll send it to you later. Uh, sorry, podcast people. If I got that wrong, um, I found it. It'll be in the description. Awesome. Um, there are Facebook groups that can teach you a lot about, uh, the profession. If you have questions, there are groups for specific, uh, softwares. Um, if you want to be a digital script supervisor and you want to use the app script E, uh, there is a Facebook group for that. And the creator of the application who, made it and regularly updates it he's in there so you can post questions and either he will answer or someone who's proficient in the application will answer or there are uh groups based on cities you know i'm in the um georgia script supervisors page and they have like a monthly meetup which i haven't been able to go to at all because i've always been working whenever they have it or there's been a worldwide pandemic um you know hate it when that happens uh there's also um great great uh just examples of continuity um and what it means in film like a lot of uh movies have blu-ray or dvd commentary where the director will break down certain things in a scene um martin scorsese's movies are great to observe continuity because he likes to intentionally break it sometimes uh and you might want to figure out why um and uh his script supervisor and editor team uh are some of the absolute best in the history of the business. Um, so definitely look into his films. Um, uh, but learn, learn what, um, I suppose, based on the page on the script, learn what kind of things are okay if they're different and what kind of things are okay if they're not. You know, if it mentions someone having rolled up sleeves, but when you get there on the set, the director doesn't want them to have rolled up sleeves. Do not cause a fuss with that unless it's relevant to the story. And even then, learn what it means to speak up about a continuity issue. It's not yelling 
stop, stop in the middle of the set. That's just the wrong way to do it. Uh, learn how to be respectful and uh, uh, still kind of focused on getting what you need done to help the movie, but not being a loud mouth or being a jerk. Um, and yeah, just watch, just watch movies. Cause there are a lot of movies that uh, can teach you how to observe continuity. Um, and that'll help you when you get on the set and um, Facebook groups are a great way to find like short films where you can really put that stuff into practice. Um, uh, so the second part of that question too, uh, how do you figure out what you want to, what you charge? Yeah. Um, it's going to vary by person and by location and by project. Um, uh, and you will sometimes have to negotiate that based on the production, whether it's a feature, a short, a TV show, whatever. Um, uh, sometimes the rate is posted. Sometimes it's just the listing and you have to figure out what the rate is. Um, I would say just do a little bit of research Googling to see what other uh, people recommend for that position. Because uh, if you Google it, you're probably going to find what people charge on the bigger movies and you're not going to be able to charge that right away. Uh, so it's a balance of looking around and seeing what you can find based on other people who do the job. And that information is out there because that's how I started finding what I wanted to charge for my rate. And also trying to keep yourself somewhat competitive. Like you got to eat, you got to have gas in your car, you got to have uh, a place to live, but also maybe think about what if your rate was a tiny bit lower? You may not get as much up front, but it might make you that much more likely to actually get hired. I'm, but know your worth. Uh, do not starve yourself. Do not let yourself be treated poorly. Um, but it's, it's just a really tricky game of trying to remain competitive and appealing to the person who's going to hire you, uh, but also taking care of yourself. I, I don't know if there's a, a single concrete answer on that, but I would say just do your... Do as much research as you can and uh, try to use your better judgment, if that makes any sense. I hope it does. Yeah. Um, so I that, absolutely I think that's that's absolutely true, you know, and that's kind of freelancing in general. Your, your rate is your rate. But then, you know, it may be uh, slightly higher, slightly lower, depending on the, the yeah. gig and the project. So I think that's really good advice. Um, Elsina uh, asked, uh, do you have a really big scripty mistake to tell? And how did you handle it? And um, how Thanks. have you handled owning up to those types of mistakes? And who do you tell the te who do you tell when you mess up? Like how do you follow the chain of command in the right way so that you don't get fired? Yeah, thanks, Alicina. That's a fun one. Um, yeah, probably the biggest single one I've made. Uh, I was working on a movie, um, and there were these two little girls that were supposed to be wearing these uh, necklaces over their dresses at a certain point in the movie, uh, and um, we had already moved on from a shot before I realized they were wearing the necklaces too early in the film for that scene. Uh, and I was focused on the dialogue and I just missed it. And, um, the, uh, crew member who had put the necklaces on them owned up to it as well. But like, I'm supposed to be the final line for continuity in the film. Uh, cause I see what the camera sees. I might not always get to see the person before they're in front of the camera, but once they're on camera, that's my responsibility. And I just did not notice because I was so focused on, it was, there were like four people talking and there was moving and the camera moved and it was on a dolly and all that. And I'm not trying to make excuses. That was me. Uh, in the end, I should have caught that. Um, the props guy was at the monitor with us and we both realized it pretty much the same time we'd already done like nine takes cause the move was hard. And, you know, in the end we talked to the director and you just got to own it and you got to, you can't like continuously beat yourself up about it. Although I'm speaking as someone who does beat myself up about my mistakes. Uh, but you gotta, you know, you apologize, you own it. Don't try to push the buck to someone else. Um, Whatever your position is, that doesn't just go with being a script supervisor. You know, um, if you're a grip and the rig collapses and you were the one who were supposed to make sure it wouldn't, own that because it's probably going to be worse if you don't. Um, and you, you might not get hired again if people realize that you lied about that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I apologized and the director ended up being really understanding. Uh, the director did not notice either. And so luckily the director had someone else on the set who does visual effects. They could paint the necklaces out. Uh, so the necklaces will not be in the scene in the movie. I hope uh, the movie's not out yet, but based on what the visual effects uh, person was saying, they were like, oh, it's an easy job. I can paint those out without any problem at all. We took the necklaces off for all the other shots in the scene. They didn't have them. So that already scared me because if, if there's something wrong with continuity, I'm like, well, if we change it, now that might be noticeably changed. But the in the end, the post person was confident they could fix this. And we just resolved to not let it happen again. Everyone who needed to apologize, apologized. No one held it against each other. We realized, you know, it got through a few different people, but we're all on the same team and getting angry and pointing fingers now isn't going to help make the movie better. Cool. I think, uh, I think that's a good answer. Um, so, uh, I don't have any more questions from chat right now. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, I want to throw to, to Doug real quick and see, um, if he had anything that he wanted to address. Well, a couple things actually. Um, I want to go back to kind of the flip of what you just talked about, about you making the mistake. How do you deal with, you know that something is wrong and you bring it up to the director and you kind of get overruled or blown off and how do you keep going? Um, it's, yeah, that's tough and that happens a lot. That's probably happened to me on just about every movie I've ever worked on. Um, uh, but, and it happens for one reason or another. I'm not trying to point a finger at any director. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just can't fix a thing because of a time constraint, because of a location constraint. Like sometimes the movie just has to go on and you like the fight you're trying to put up is not worth the effort it's going to take to change the thing or the director's choice is more important than my suggestion. And that's all that I am in the end is someone who suggests things. It is not your job to change the director's mind. It is your job to make it, to make them aware of the thing politely and respectfully and essentially try to phrase things as a question more often than not. Um, like, Hey, um, just so you know, uh, in the previous scene, he was wearing his watch on his left arm. Now it's on his right. And maybe you have an iPad or a computer with a screen grab and you can show it to them and you say, hey, here it is. Um, the watch is on the different arm now. That's going to be seen. What would you like to do? Or do you want to keep it that way? That way you put the ball in the director's court and they get to make the call. Because in the end, no matter what, the director can overrule you. It does not matter what production you're on, which script supervisor you are, what director you're working with, what scale production. In the end, it's the director's movie. You were there to help them make it. So um, I can think of a movie I worked on one time where someone was supposed to have a, a, a wound painted on their body, like a, a special effects slash makeup kind of thing. They'd gotten hurt uh, in a scene prior to the scene we were shooting. Uh, but on the day when we were shooting it, we were rushing, uh, not rushing. We just, we had to move quick to, to not lose the daylight we had. And uh, there just wasn't time to put that on the person. I made the director aware, but we had to go anyway. Um, I made a note for the editor. Uh, you know, character does not have wound from scene blank. Um, I wrote it on the script. I wrote it in my notes to the editor. And we just kept going because the movie, the show must go on, you know. Uh, and that's... That's just one of those examples where, you know, you as the script supervisor or as the crew member, you might know this thing could potentially be a problem down the line, but like you can't hold up the entire movie. Um, it's, it's the director's movie. It's the producer's movie. You just got to do your job, keep your concerns to yourself at that point and keep going. One of the, I, I'm going to push just a little harder because I know you and know that um you can tend to get up in your own head about yeah. things. Um, how do you keep moving forward after either you've made a mistake or something like this has happened where you've been overruled? Um, how do you change the inner dialogue and keep moving forward? Yeah. 
I definitely, uh, I will beat myself up. I'm my own worst. Exactly. Um, and I feel like a lot of people are like that, even if they Mm -hmm. don't want to admit it. Um, but as long as you've owned up to your mistake or as long as you've made the concern aware, as long as you've done everything you can to address the situation properly, you just have to then kind of tell yourself, well, I'm not going to let this derail the rest of whatever it is I have to do. Gotcha. Um, the movie needs people to keep working and I'm not going to stop just because of this one thing. I've done all I can. Now I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I'm better or make sure the movie doesn't have this problem again or that I don't let this happen again. Whatever it is, you just you have to tell yourself what I have to do is more important than worrying about what I've already done. I've got a couple other questions that I want to totally off yeah. different direction. Sure. Um, I knew you when you were in film school. And so I've got two things I want to ask you about kind of looking back now, kind of yeah. retrospective 2020. Hey, hey, Doug. Well, let me yeah. interrupt you real quick. Uh, sure. Just to remind everybody, uh, we are going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. So if you have any other questions you want to ask Josh, make sure you get them in the chat so we have time to get them in there before we, we stop. So um, I'll go back to you, Doug. Sorry, I just wanted to let everybody know. Not a problem. Um, you were pretty idealistic when you, were gradu- mm. when you just graduated. Yeah. How have you redefined your idea of what success is now that you've been out and beaten up and bumped around? I mean, coming up when I was in school, it was like, I don't know, the, the industry, the film industry was like this, it seemed like this corporate machine that wanted to stifle creativity in a person like me. And I just wanted, I thought success was like making a movie that was unfettered by what someone else might think, um, which was such a selfish way to look at making a movie because making a movie is collaborative. Um, I had a lot of growing up to do. I had to experience a lot more. Um, I just coming out of school, I really didn't care about things like box office numbers. I didn't care about metrics or charts or things like that. And it was wrong of me to completely disregard those things. Um, it was wrong of me to take such a strong stance against uh suggestions like that um so i guess uh i've become a lot more savvy to the logistics of making a movie in the time since then uh i've realized a lot more the immense uphill struggle it is to make anything um and so even if you might not agree with every choice being made on a film it was really hard to get to that point So if you're involved, just try to help it finish, help it get where it needs to be, because what are you going to gain from complaining? What are you going to gain from being the negative Nelly? Uh, Just try to help, even if you don't love the project, try to help make it as good as possible for the people involved. Even if it's just being, saying a kind word, or when you go to Crafty, maybe grab an extra water bottle to handy or friend or another crew member that you can see has been working really hard um and success is now i mean it's still a hard thing to define in the movie business because you have you know movies that make a billion dollars and then you have movies that just get sold and i think to me success would just be to make things and be able to survive off of that and not have to give up on the dream of making movies Total, totally change of subject. Um, if I remember correctly, when before you were actually in your junior year in the program, when, when you were still in your sophomore year, um, you acted in a whole bunch of little projects. Yes. Um, do you have any advice for people that um, are kind of at that stage of their world? They're, you know, they're just just kind of beginning a serious kind of film education. Um, yeah. Yeah. And how did you maintain all the energy? You were like, there are two or three times I remember you were like on three sets at the on the same day. Yeah. Uh, well, I grew up and I used to act more, but it was more like theater stuff uh, when I was younger. Um, and 
uh, when I got to film school, well, when I got to college before film school, I was so nervous I would not get in to the film program. Uh, I was just not confident because I was, you know, really far away from home. Uh, I didn't know that many people, but I got connected to some of the film students. And I thought, as long as I can get on a set, I'll still be learning something. And maybe, uh, maybe they'll see my work ethic and they'll want to let me in to the film school. Um, so I, again, well, thank you again. Yeah. I had that little bit of background in acting. So I thought if, if, if I can do one thing, it's hopefully say words in front of a camera. Um, so yeah, I, I got connected with some of the film students and I acted in like one short film and they didn't totally hate me. So they started calling me back and then their classmates saw those films and they called me for their films. And so I did like three versions of the same script sometimes, um, because they would all make, you know, the same movie just in different ways. Uh, and yeah, uh, I would just say, try to get on any movie set you can. Um, don't just loiter. Obviously don't be that person, you know, just like, Oh, what are you guys doing? Uh, but like try to get there and help whether you're a PA whether you're an extra or background talent, uh, whatever you can do to get on a set and learn something, that's the most valuable thing I think you could be doing. Uh, that time in that I was acting in those films taught me a monumental amount. And it showed me that not only do I really want to do this, but I think once I get to where these students are at, I can. Um, and it just it took away a lot of the uh, intimidation factor of movie sets and the nebulous concept of film school in general. Um, and I got to meet some of my favorite people by doing that. Uh, you know, people you've had on the show before, like Cody Wilson, I met by acting in films. I met Spencer by acting in films. Um, I met Corey Neff by acting in films. Uh, so Some yeah, of my favorite it just, people. yeah, it was all just about um, helping wherever I could and where they needed me at that time was acting in the movies rather than being part of the crew. So I was happy to be there. Um, I've got, I've got um, one last kind of oh, question. Um, and maybe it's too personal, but one of the things I know about you is that you like you like to please people. Mm. Talk a little bit. I'd like you to talk a little bit about how that's good in the film business and how it's bad. Yeah. Uh, I know the Enneagram is popular. So on the Enneagram, I'm a type two. Uh, I really, really like to help people or please people or just be around people. <laughs> um, and I know that, and it's a strength and a weakness, definitely. Uh, so when I'm on a movie, I'll do whatever I can to try to help other people. I'll be like, Hey, can I help you with that? Can I do this? Can I do that? And they'll be like, no, it's not your department. Go away. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I've done crafty for a few projects, uh, craft services. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just walk around whenever I did that, I would just walk around with water bottles or with snacks and be like, Hey, you want this? You want this? Uh, cause it's, it's like a compulsion to try to help people. Um, and I feel like that, that like sounds like I'm bragging, but it's also a totally bad thing sometimes because I will stick my nose where it doesn't belong. Uh, I will try to help when my help is not needed or, or wanted. And it's, it's just part of growing up and being a person learning when to try to ignore that, that compulsion. Um, but when I say movies are collaborative, they 100% they are more than people who don't work on movies could ever imagine. You might think a movie is like 100% uh, the director. It's not. Like the director guides the ship, but the, the people who keep the ship afloat are also on board. Um, and um, I have like this just desire to try to help however possible. And that's part of why I'll beat myself up so bad if something's wrong and I could have stopped it. Um, you know, when I, I've always thought, like when you can help, you should. Um, and sometimes that's not true <laughs> because it's a professional environment and there's money at stake. And sometimes the camera team does not want the script supervisor to try to help carry the tripod. <laughs> um, so you just have to learn when and when not to offer help. Um, and it's all about just learning how to connect with people. 
um, because you'll be able to read their body language, read their face, uh, see what's going on, read the room. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question in some way. That, that was good. Cool. Cool. Well, um, I am, uh, I don't, we don't have anything else from chat, uh, right now. So I think I am gonna, uh, say it's about time to wrap it up. So, um, Josh, where can folks find you if they want to follow what you're doing? Um, you know, see what films you're making, see what films you've been scripting on, whatever it is, how can they find you? Uh, yeah. and yeah, there you go. Tell them. I mean, obviously you can find me on like IMDb. Um, that's like the film online resume more or less like a list of the things you've done but like you can find me on social media facebook and uh instagram at at josh kirkland it's just my name um i post the most on instagram um i'll post like stills of the films i've made or bts photos of the stuff i'm working on or whatever um and on my my like business facebook page i try to post a lot of content like that too um I guess if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at the Josh Kirkland, uh, because I wasn't fast enough to get my name on Twitter. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tweet like little thoughts about a movie I'm working on or watching. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I try to share photos of the, uh, the journey I'm on, I guess wherever I am or whatever I'm doing. Um, like Reggie, my recent short, I have a lot of BTS photos for that that I've shared on Instagram in, or in particular. Um, I have a short that's going to come out hopefully sometime soon. Uh, and I've shared screenshots from that multiple times. Um, and uh, yeah, there's just photos of my friends working on movies with me, uh, me working on movies with my friends um, and uh, little glimpses at the stuff I do. So yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook that way. Uh, I hope that answers that. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, well, I think that, uh, oh, you got a couple new followers, it looks like, according to chat. But um, So I think that's about it for me. Uh, Josh, do you have anything else you want to add here at the end? Uh, I guess just to echo something Mr. Miller told me many moons ago is, uh, whoever you are, whatever you're trying to do in movies or not, just be aware of how much there is you don't know. Um, everyone around you is working really hard to make these things happen too. You are not greater than someone else just because you might have worked on more movies or you might have seen more movies uh, or you might know more about Federico Fellini or whoever. Uh, you, you are just a person trying to figure, out, figure it out as you go and so are they. Um, so try to show empathy, um, try to show compassion. I know that might sound like almost like cheesy to say, but like, I promise in this, in this movie business that goes so much farther than you might know. Um, I mean, I can think of specific moments where just trying to be nice to someone made all the difference and someone being kind to me really, really turned an experience around for me. Um, and sometimes it's the most random thing. One time when I was working on a movie with Spencer and Dylan Stein and a bunch of other people you guys know, I got a nail on my tire in the middle of a shoot day and I had to miss some of the shooting to go get my tire patched up so I could drive anywhere. And the tire guys fixed my tire for free. And that like turned a bad day into a really, really nice experience. So I could go right back to the movie and I didn't have to spend all that money. And they were just really kind to me and the movie kept going. Um, so it's like the little things that you can do for other people and just being, trying to be a good person. Cause it's always a, a struggle. It's always a journey. Like try to do those things because that'll make it, that'll make all the difference. Cool. That great advice to end on. Um, all right. Well, Josh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, and you guys can, can find links to his social media down at the bottom. Uh, Doug, thank you again for co-hosting. Uh, that was great. Um, and so for those of you guys, uh, we will be back again next week. We may actually have two episodes next week. Uh, we'll see what's happening. Uh, one, uh, we have a location manager, um, from out in LA who will be joining us, who can talk about, uh, some of the challenges that, um, 
you know, happen with uh, doing, well, location managing and finding places to shoot. Um, and then we may have one other episode coming up, so keep an eye on the Twitter. Uh, that is down uh, in the description below, so make sure you uh, you follow us on Twitter. Um, and subscribe on YouTube, that would really help us out as well. Um, but until next time, uh, this has been The False Takes, and this is a show about art, film, and the mistakes that we all make along the path to creating something new. So... Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.